Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. In 2016, while on the campaign trail for Hillary Clinton, President Obama uttered two words that rang out across the nation, piquing the interest of Monday night football viewers everywhere. These words were heard during this year's campaign as well. In this week's episode, we have a discussion with Jesse Barrett about football and politics. Oh yeah, what were the words President Obama said on the trail? Well, it's a phrase that we often say when something just makes us shake our heads and go, come on, man. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is November 3rd, 2020. And we're in everywhere USA. I mean, I know, it's just yesterday, not like we went too far in the past. But it's a big deal, because this was election day for 2020. And it kind of ties in fittingly with this week's topic. You see, this week's guest is going to be Jesse Barrett, and he rides shotgun with us to talk about his book, Pigskin Nation. I mean, think about it. When you first heard that title, what did you think of? Did you think of, this book is going to be about how football became America's favorite sport? I mean, that's what I thought. But in a way, I guess it kind of is. However, that's not really what the book's about. Jesse takes a different angle on the topic of football and politics. Like, what football and politics have in common and how they have shaped, or at least helped each other shape, over the years. It is called Pigskin Nation, How the NFL Remade American Politics. And speaking of the book, (laughs) you better believe it, we have another giveaway for you. Jesse has offered to autograph and send a copy of his book to one lucky winner. All you have to do, head over to the website, sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. And after entering the contest, you're going to want to go ahead and stick around on the website because there's so much more that you can learn about Jesse's work, as well as other great content that we have on Sports History Network, the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. But for now, let's get right into this uniquely different type of interview for the podcast, which is with Mr. Jesse Barrett. Yeah, sure. However you want to do it or whatever. And one of the, (laughs) yeah, one of the things I wanted to ask you too is like, I mean, when did it dawn on you that you wanted to write a book about politics and what it had to do with the NFL? Um, It's, I don't know if I directly started there. What I started with, so I went to Michigan for college Um, and just really, it's a really, like, it's a weird story now just thinking of how kids apply to college because I grew up in Ann Arbor till I was seven. And then when we moved, I decided, well, I'm going to Michigan for college, you know, and then I got to be 17 and apparently I hadn't had a single other thought in a decade. So I was like, well, time to apply to Michigan. You know, so I went to Michigan and I went to football games there when I was an undergrad for most of the time. And I kind of just kept up with it. And so, I don't know, probably 2009, I would guess, 2008, 2009, I was reading this book by Michael Rosenberg called War As They Knew It, which is about the 10 years that Woody Hayes and Bo Schembeck were coached against each other. And because I just started keeping up with Michigan football. And there was an anecdote there about the Michigan kicker being late to practice one day because he'd been at a protest. And I just thought, that's weird. You know, both of those things are happening at the same time. And so it was kind of the start there was just, it was really football and politics in the 60s. And so I just kind of started researching a little bit. And eventually what I wrote was about six years later, I just, I kind of messed around with two chapters for literally five years. And then about six years later, I had some time off from my job and I wrote 
about 350 pages in 10 months and sent it to the publisher who said, you know, congratulations, this is a lot of stuff. If you want anybody to publish this, you're <laughs> going to cut out a third of it and figure out what your story is. And so, you know, I had a lot of stuff about college football in there that was interesting, but not that connected. So it really kind of evolved. And then I, you know, shaped out of that mess of 350 pages, about 215 pages that were really just about the NFL and politics. And the other thing that's that's actually just weird in retrospect is that I was finishing this book. So I finished a draft in probably the spring of 2016. And then I'm, I was doing the final edits, getting ready for publication in the fall of 2017, which is when the whole thing with Colin Kaepernick and Trump and Mike Pence blew up. And weirdly, it didn't occur to me that I should maybe talk about that in the epilogue of the book. <laughs> You know, like I've just been doing it for so long that it didn't occur to me, like, it's literally happening right now. You know, I, I wrote a couple articles. I mean, the funny thing is I was reading the news and there was um, the oh, the 49ers were playing the Colts. And Mike Pence basically decided, you know, they were going to kneel and he was going to show he was appalled. And so he showed up, the 49ers and Colts knelt and he left. And I, and I thought, you know, oh, my God, I literally have written a book on this exact topic. And I sent Politico an email and said, you're not going to believe this. But there's actually somebody out here who is writing a book on the exact topic of the thing that is happening right now. And so I published an article in Politico and some other places that just suddenly seemed relevant. But the honest answer is that it kind of sneaked up on me. Yeah, I mean, it's something that, like you said, that uh, the book release around the same time is something that really was happening in the NFL. And of, for my my generation, for instance, like I don't remember the 60s and I know there was a lot of I guess it's a tumultuous time, we'll call it, for not just the league, but also in everything, everything that was going on in the world. And I know a lot of people keep talking about some of the similarities to some of the things that are going on now. And I can't, from a firsthand experience, really relate to it. But uh, I mean, your book kind of did. A, you know, let's just get into the book. Let's just talk about go back to the beginning. What was the book? How did it start? And let's go from there. Um, well, also, I should say me neither. I mean, I, you know, I was four when the 60s ended. So I have zero memory also, you know, it's, I'm in mean, history, so I have sort of some acquaintance with studying the past, but yeah, I, I was drawing on no personal memories at all either. You know, I think the earliest, I think it was the, God, I think it's the 1974 Super Bowl, the one where the Raiders beat the Vikings. I think that's the first Super Bowl I remember watching. So yeah, my, you know, my memory, it's not, I'm doing this based on anything that I actually knew. Um, I mean, what I, eventually after I was kind of messing around with all this stuff is I realized the book kind of naturally had two halves, which is one is about what the NFL did as a political and cultural entity to make itself popular. Um, you know, Pete Rizal was really crucial there. I think just understanding that all the guys who'd been, all the men who'd been pro football commissioners before Rosell had been former players or coaches or owners or, or all of those things. And so they were really football guys. You know, for them, it was about this fairly niche sport you know, it wasn't – pro football was not super popular, right? I mean, you know, at this point, college football is really a much bigger deal in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. You know, you think of the 1920s, right, that the NFL is founded in 1920, and the famous college football players from that period are college players like Red Grange, you know, who eventually goes pro, but he's famous for what he did at Illinois. So, you know, so when Pete Rozelle becomes commissioner, he's the first guy who comes in from outside the kind of very small world of pro football people. and his big realization is he'd come from advertising and he brought in a bunch of guys who are from advertising. And so the first half of the book is about how these guys, especially starting in the sixties, realized that they had to sell football, that the famous, you know, what they looked at was baseball and they thought baseball is the kind of official American sport, right? If you ask people, what's the national pastime, people would have said baseball. And Roselle thought, I want that. You know, the point is that we should make the NFL as popular as major league baseball. And so the first half of the book is kind of studying all the different ways they do that in printed material, in visual material, in kind of political interventions, and just, you know, kind of trying to tell those different stories of how the NFL tried to make itself a political actor and, you know, get things it wanted. That's one of the parts that was really interesting for me was things like antitrust. You know, I hadn't, probably most people don't think about antitrust a ton, but, you know, the NFL in essence, was a monopoly, right? I mean, they're, uh, you know, in fact, they're to have a TV contract, for instance. You know, the TV contract is what made the NFL possible because the Packers could compete against the Giants, right? Otherwise, if you look at revenue, there's no way the Packers are going to be able to get a TV contract and have money comparable to what the New York Giants are going to have, and the Giants are going to destroy the Packers in general, unless you have some way of equalizing revenue. 
And so the NFL, but of course, the problem is that's not a free market. And so the NFL had to get that through Congress. And they had to get congressmen to agree that it was actually better for the NFL to have something that made the league as a whole viable. And just the political machinations were just fascinating there to kind of think, you know, these things that you don't really think about, right? The kind of legal aspect of what makes a league possible to run, especially, I think, because the NFL for years, I don't think it necessarily did so itself, but people kept celebrating it as like democracy and capitalism in action. And there was this kind of vision that, you know, it's hard hitting, it's a good fight, and that's what democracy is. And, you know, Art Modell, who is the Cleveland Browns owner for years, and I know everybody in Cleveland hates him now because he moved the Browns, moved the Browns <laughs> right. and stole them away to Baltimore. You know, Modell famously said, we're a bunch of fat cat Republicans who vote socialist. And he was describing the NFL. And so that was really one of the more fascinating stories of the first part of the book for me is kind of looking at how the NFL operated as a political entity in Washington. You know, and Roselle, again, was really savvy there. He was thinking about how do you get Congress people on your side to pass laws that help you thrive as a league? Yeah. Were there any recollections of, I don't know what the best way, like a give and take, um, scratch your back kind of thing, politicians and NFL owners that were really relevant that no one knows about? Um, probably the one people may know a little bit about is the Saints. Because so in in the 60s, basically TV – so the kind of major story is, you know, is that the greatest game ever played, quote unquote, is 1958. The Giants and the Colts. That's one where Alan Amici scores in overtime. You know, United leads the last second drive to tie it. There's literally, I think, five or six books just on that game. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. and so, and I think after that, it became clear that TV was the wave of the future. And so getting into the 60s, the NFL kept trying to sign these TV contracts. And in fact, actually, the AFL did so first. You know, they were so much more desperate because they had so little money and so many of their franchises were kind of hanging on that they really pioneered a lot of these things. Like they put, you know, numbers, they put the names on the back of the players' jerseys for the first time. And they signed a, a TV contract that the NFL copied. And so they were trying to get this. They got it renewed in 1961 based on the competitive balance idea. But then in 66, the leagues agreed on a merger, famously. You know, that they realized they were going to spend each other into oblivion. And so they figured if they merged, then this way they could keep each other from killing each other. The problem is that's a huge antitrust violation. You know, from the player's perspective, you look at Joe Namath, right? You know, Namath, there's a bidding war. Namath signs this $427,000 contract with the Jets. He gets a jet green Cadillac because he can play the leagues off against each other. When the leagues merge, nobody can do that anymore. So the problem is this is, you know, a pretty... That's, you know, that's a monopoly. That is the textbook definition of a monopoly. And it in the House, it runs into the House Judiciary Committee, whose chairman is a guy named Emanuel Seller, who's from Brooklyn. And, you know, being from Brooklyn is important here because he's still mad about the Dodgers. You know, this is literally almost a decade later, right? The Dodgers leave Brooklyn in 57. This is 1966. And Seller literally says, I am not going to let this merger go through because I think it's anti-competitive. And in the book, I have telegrams that the players sent tons of telegrams saying, please let us testify. You know, we think this is a terrible idea. And so what happens is Roselle meets with, so the House Majority Whip, and I think the chairman of the Senate, I think it's Ways and Means Community, community um, Committee, are both from Louisiana. And so, you know, Roselle says to them, well, maybe we could work something out. And they say really clearly to him, Okay, let's be really clear about this. Here's what's going to happen. We will get this through if you give us a football team. No, you know, no ifs, ands, and buts about this. This is what will happen. Not, you know, this, well, let, you know, Rizal kind of tried to finesse it and say, you know, we'll really look favorably on this or thinking about it. And they said, no, you will give us a football team. Um, there are hearings in front of Congress where literally one of them says, you know, it's the South's time. You owe us kind of historically, there's all these teams, right? The NFL, when it's formed, is all sort of you know, northern industrial states, right? It's basically New York to Wisconsin, and it's all kind of it's centered up there and all these teams that don't exist anymore, um, you know, or places like Akron. And so they're saying, you know, historically, you guys, people in the South love football and you've ignored football. And so, so what happens is, shockingly, literally the week, I think, before the merger is pushed through Congress, the NFL makes an announcement that the New Orleans Saints will begin play the next year. So that's a really clear, you know, just quid pro quo between the two sides. Um, maybe the other one, if you want to talk about it, is Vietnam. I don't know if you want to kind of go in somewhere else, but that's maybe one of the other really interesting things where they're kind of in bed with each other. 
Yeah, I think it. I, this is exactly why I wanted to bring you on because the the perspective, we'll say, of the NFL is unlike anybody else that I would have had on the show. So let's talk about that, the Vietnam and NFL and how everything kind of coll- collided, we'll say. Okay. Um, so what's, again, it's it's the same thing is the comparison with baseball. And and so obviously, you know, during World War One, there's no baseball. There's, there's, sorry, there's no football. There's Major League Baseball. They consider shortening the season. Um, you know, recently people have written articles about how there were pandemic issues too, which I hadn't even known about in 1918. Um, during World War II, there is the NFL and there's Major League Baseball. And there's a letter I quote in the book where I think it was Burt, I'm trying to remember if it was Burt Bell. I don't think it was Burt Bell. I think whoever the NFL commissioner was writes a letter to FDR after Pearl Harbor and says, what do you think about football? And FDR sends this kind of notorious letter in football circles that says, you know, basically, sorry, it's, I realize it's a baseball letter. He's, so he sends it to Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who's the baseball commissioner. And, and he says, you know, baseball is an important part of the national spirit. So we need to keep baseball going during World War II. He doesn't mention football. So football is not important during World War II. And there's all these famous stories where the, you know, the Steelers and the Eagles had to merge forming the Steagles and the Cardinals and the Steelers merge forming the Carpets, which is just an awful name for a team. You know, because it was so marginal that something like 600, it was the number I think is 638 NFL players are drafted in World War II. Whereas very, you know, sort of there's famous stories like Ted Williams served in World War II. You know, so some baseball players served, but a lot of them didn't have to. So when you get to Vietnam, the NFL wants what baseball has, which is exemptions. And so what you have is a bunch of these really close connections. And there literally is the National Guard recruiting officer from Maryland. The Colts gave him his own uniform. So there's a picture of him in Life magazine, and he's kind of doing the Heisman pose. And this is this, you know, dumpy 50s-ish guy. So it's not, he doesn't look great in his Colts uniform. But he's got his very own Colts uniform with a helmet. You know, and, and he literally says, we will do what we need to. And so, you know, the National Guard in, I think, 1968 had a 100,000-person waiting list. You know, obviously, if you could do your service in the National Guard, you didn't have to go to Vietnam. And if you're a football player, you got right to the top of the list. And so there's a ton of stories that came out in 1966-67 pointing out that the NFL had become important enough to have this incredibly cozy relationship with draft boards. And there's an amazing story in Rocky Blyer's autobiography where he talks about this, that, that you know, he got, he's sort of the most famous NFL player to go to Vietnam. It's because he's one of six. The NFL had six players who served in Vietnam between 1965 and 1972. I mean, that's you know, astonishing, right? These incredibly young, fit, strong men, six of them were deemed suitable for service. And what's even more amazing is that in the story, it's only because the Steelers, they have literally three or four connections, all of which fall through, that are all going to get Blyer to do National Guard service. And then finally, his hometown draft board, instead of a Pittsburgh draft board, which would have been probably looking favorably on what the Steelers wanted, his hometown draft board calls him up and says, you got to serve, you know, you're not, we don't care about this. So he goes off and serves and literally it's in the, and I think I read a book by Art Rooney who talked about this, you know, from the, from the famous family that owned the Steelers. And he literally said something like the draft board was not thinking about what Rocket Blair could do for the Pittsburgh Steelers. That was his take on, you know, how important service in Vietnam was <laughs> versus being able to play fullback for the Steelers. So you said that the home board get, called him up and said, was it not randomized? I mean, how, how did that work? So I, yeah, I had to learn a ton about how the draft worked because it was one of those things that I sort of knew, but basically it depended where your draft call came from. And so, you know, he could, basically he could have been classified as an employee of the Steelers, which would mean his location would be Pennsylvania. Um, but apparently the person who was going to classify him as such died. And so he was instead classified as where he had grown up, which was in Wisconsin. And so the Wisconsin Draft Board called him and didn't think that his being able to play for the Steelers was particularly important. And so it's just, it's this amazing story that the way he tells it in the book, you know, there's no irony about the fact that we were using all these connections to get Rocky Blair out of serving. It's more that he's indignant that they didn't get Rocky Blair out of serving and Rocky Blair had to go to Vietnam. And so he was, you know, he can, he was an incredibly heroic performer over there. It's just the amazing context of, you know, from the football perspective, that was just, wasted time he could have been playing for the Steelers. 
Yeah, during, I guess, again, going from the football perspective, probably some of his prime years in the game, uh, you mentioned the National Guard. So would some players be signed up for the National Guard while also be playing and then they just serve some things at home? Or? Um, there's, a, there's a great story I actually have in the book about Jerry Smith, who was a tight end for the Redskins. And in this, there's an amazingly packed weekend in November 69. Um, Nixon is the first. So Richard Nixon, which is, I guess we can get into the second half of the book in a little bit. You know, Richard Nixon was a huge football player. And he's the first, he's the only president to go to an AFL game. He's the first president to go to a regular season NFL game. And he goes to watch the Redskins play the Cowboys in November 1969. Literally the week before there had been these massive protest marches against the war, Jerry Smith is called up. He's the tight end for the Redskins and he's called up in his National Guard unit. And there's a newspaper story that says, you know, Jerry Smith had a tear gas canister and he fumbled it and literally dropped it on his own unit. And then that Sunday he got three touchdown passes against the Cowboys. So there were literally, you know, sort of within the same week, you could have a player serving in a guard unit and then playing football. Serving in a guard unit as in like here training and things like that. Not he wasn't. Right, he was in D.C. Right? because there were these huge protest marches. So they were literally patrolling the protest marches. And yeah, and then so he just went over to yeah the Redskins Stadium on Sunday and played there. Yeah, <laughs> fumbling the tear gas and then catching three touchdowns right after that. I mean, you said that getting into like more your second half of the book and Richard Nixon and the NFL. I mean, what did he have to do, and why do you bring up that um, name? So the second half, what I ended up doing was talking about how football put itself in the political arena, and then all the ways in which politicians used it in this period. And Nixon was just obvious because it's, you know, if there's, I mean, okay, I don't know what people know about Richard Nixon. You know, probably people necessarily don't know anything because he resigned from the presidency in 1974. But if they do, one thing they've probably heard of is that Nixon was a football nut. So I knew I was going to have to write about Nixon. And so I went to the Nixon library. I read his papers there. I read a bunch of the papers of people in his circle. Um, there's actually, I, I'm mad at myself about this um, because there are audio tapes of Nixon's meetings where he's talking to people like George Allen. And he had this, you know, so Allen was um, actually the coach at Whittier, which was Nixon's alma mater, where he played football, but never lettered. And then he became the Redskins coach. And so they were friends and they wrote each other. There's pictures. He, you know, he sent notes to Allen's house. So I knew I was going to have to talk about Nixon because Nixon was a football fan, had talked about football for years, used football, was friends with football coaches. He appeared at a campaign rally with Woody Hayes in Columbus, Ohio, 1970. Allen campaigned for him. There's literally a Nixon for re-election brochure from 1972 where George Allen's on the cover, you know, saying be on Nixon's team. So he both used football metaphors constantly. Um, I, think, I think at the beginning of that chapter, I quote, you know, all the ways in which Nixon, he literally talked about football. He called, you know, 1972, they're running for re-election. And he said, tonight, the fourth quarter begins. The fourth quarter really determines the game. He was just constantly using football metaphors when he, so famously, when he, when he took the nomination in 1968, one of the people he thanked was Wallace Newman, his football coach at Whittier, for teaching him how to lose, how to be a team player, how to struggle and succeed. So I felt like you just, you know, and there's novels making fun of Nixon. There's a Philip Roth novel called Our Gang, which is about Trick E. Dixon, and it's got a scene where he basically is feeling kind of tense and upset. And so he puts on his NFL um, jock, basically, and then goes on TV and you know gives an interview. And he talks about how it sort of makes him feel better. So it was a thing people talked about at the time, and people have talked about it ever since. And I felt like I was going to have to kind of get at it in a better way than just, wow, Richard Dixon was totally obsessed with football. Isn't that weird? Right, yeah. I mean, is there something – I mean, other than those or any kind of um... – uh, geez, I don't know interactions or interventions with the NFL when during his time. Um, there were there weren't a ton. What he tended to do was he'd invite in football players. He tried to get endorsements. He'd appear. You know, he had prayer breakfasts with people. Like, so he had Bud Wilkinson, the former Oklahoma coach, who was a kind of free floating advisor in the White House, and they would have in you know the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So it was more kind of symbolic stuff. Um, there's a great point when in 1972 he's really trying to get black athletes. And so the, the White House scheduling office says, we're trying to get Gail Sayers in. Anytime, I mean, this is the president, right? The president says, the president's scheduling office says, anytime Gail Sayers wants to come in, the president will make time for him. 
So it was kind of like Nixon wanted to be seen with these people. His real political connection, the, the only time he really did something was when he weighed in in favor of changing the TV ban. You know, I'm sure, you know, people who listen to this know that the NFL used to have a ban. I think it was within 75 miles that unless the game was sold out, you couldn't see it on TV. And the NFL, you know, was saying like, this is killing us. You need to let us televise the games. And eventually Congress kind of pushed through this bill and Nixon lobbied in favor of it. I think apparently because he was really, you know, angry, he couldn't see the Redskins when he was in Florida. You know, so just like it bothered him that it was hard to watch his favorite team. And so he kind of weighed mm -hmm. in. So it's more for him kind of a symbolic thing than a weighing in, you know, different than Donald Trump, let's say. And then, you know, and then Nixon, <laughs> I wasn't yeah. going to say anything, but uh, it kind of reminds me of yeah, I mean, that's, I know. That's, what's really interesting to me is that how how much better Nixon's rhetoric looks than Trump's in terms of football. You know, that the, the sort of classic thing about football, if you go back to like Theodore Roosevelt, who I think is the first president ever to mention football, is that Roosevelt talks about football. Literally, he's telling the boys club in like 1912, I think, you know, hit the line hard, fight hard for what you want. Um, Dwight Eisenhower, who played football at West Point, apparently he was pretty good until he hurt his knee, said something like, you know, I want football men in positions of leadership because they've shown – they're hard fighting and heroic and know how to lead men. So, you know, the kind of rhetoric of football and toughness. And of course, you know, there's actually, I have a little anecdote about the Kennedys, that the Kennedys had these famous touch football games, you know, that Bobby Kennedy apparently, like Frank Gifford, you know, who played in the NFL for like a decade, said, you know, the games were a little scary. <laughs> You know, this is Frank Gifford, who has that famous hit, right? When you know, he's basically been wiped out by Chug Bednarik and he's lying there and he looks like he's dead. I mean, that really famous photograph from Sports Illustrated. Frank Gifford says, you know, the Kennedys football games were a little bit crazy. And apparently Bobby would get really mad if you dropped a pass. So, you know, the rhetoric had been there all along and Nixon kind of fits in there. And Reagan does too. That's where the epilogue goes is that, you know, people like Nixon and Reagan talked about football as teaching you how to play a team sport. How to using, how to fight hard within the rules. That that was the kind of traditional rhetoric of football. And the thing that was amazing to me is when you read the stuff from Trump, you know, Trump is complaining that things like, you know, unnecessary roughness penalties, there's too many of them, there should be more like neck tackling. That it was kind of, if you remember the XFL, you know, the one year of the XFL, where the whole, you know, promotional thing of like, you know, people are going to die playing XFL football, right? They had that ad where literally the guy, like there's a kick return and he's hit by a wrecking ball. You know, there were no fair catches. And it was that kind of rhetoric of like, you know, football is just unrestrained brutality. That's kind of the way Trump has talked about it, that, you know, he said that you can't have people like clotheslining each other anymore. And so Nixon, you know, it's really interesting that at the time, people called Nixon a fascist. And I read a lot of alternative weeklies, you know, which are very much on the, you know, America's terrible, America's fascist, football is terrible, football is also fascist. And so therefore, Nixon liking football is fascist. And if you read it now, you know, it's actually very much Nixon says things like, I learned how to succeed and I learned how to fail and I learned humility from playing football. So his rhetoric, I feel like, has actually dated pretty well in that way, in a way that I don't think people in 1971 who were making fun of Nixon would have thought. And you mentioned going back and reading those. What other kinds of, I don't know, resources did you a different type of book. I mean, how did you compile a book of so many to get the original 315 pages or whatever it was? Um, there's – so, I mean, there's a ton – you know, the NFL – one of the things Roosevelt, uh, Roosevelt – that uh, Roselle did was he created all these arms in the 60s. So, they're, they're of a publishing arm. So, I read all the books the NFL published in the 60s. I watched as many of the TV things as I could have. And there's – you know, there's already an excellent book on the NFL on TV by Travis Vogan. Um, who it turned out ended up was one of the readers outside for the press on the book. You know, so he'd kind of covered that already, but I just, I wanted to look at the video stuff. Um, and then I tried to read all the newspaper articles I could. I read all the alternative weeklies I could. Um, I read all the magazine articles I could and all the books that were, so you can actually go to WorldCat, which is a catalog of pretty much every book that has ever been published. And so if you search, you know, if you set the search terms for things like football from 1960 onward, I could find pretty much every book that had been published on football from, let's say, 1960 to 1975. And I, as many of those as seemed relevant, I tried to read. And then I also, I thought of all the politicians. So Hubert Humphrey has papers. George McGovern has papers. Um, Eugene McCarthy had papers. Rockefeller had papers. Nixon had papers. Agnew had papers. And a lot of them now are on the web. So, you know, 50 years ago, you would have had to go to the archive. 
you know, some of them I, I, I hired people. So the two Louisiana senators who were involved in getting the um, Saints, you know, I, I hired a grad student at Tulane and she went through the papers and you know, I said, here's what I want you to look for. And so she sent me that stuff. So it was kind of a combination of literally everything I could find that would cover this. And I think that's, I mean, that's one thing I was just proud of is feeling like there's a lot of interesting different stuff here that, you know, doesn't necessarily, you know, that you don't see in all the books on this topic. And I talked to a couple people. There's definitely more people I wish I had spoken to. I think a couple of people I found later on were still around and I wished I'd thought of talking to them before. But one of my favorites was I talked to Ray Shonky, who was a guard for the Redskins in the 70s, and he was the chairman of Athletes from McGovern. And so just hear these amazing stories about what it's like to be a pro football player who had a political consciousness. And, you know, literally what he said was, so he went to SMU. He was an academic All-American. You know, and SMU is in Dallas, you know, which was sort of notorious in the 60s as the city that had killed John F. Kennedy. And he talked about getting into fights all the time with his teammates, intellectual fights, you know, with his professors, because he didn't believe what they believed. And he also was part Hawaiian, so I think he had the consciousness of being a person of color in Dallas in the early 60s. And he hadn't necessarily had a chance to exercise this until he gets to Washington. And then he said literally, you know, he was reading McGovern's position papers. And to me, this is just an amazing kind of time capsule thing. He just walked over to McGovern's office and knocked on the door. And he said, hi, my name is Ray Shunky. I'm playing on the Redskins. I'd like to work for McGovern, organize some athletes. And they said, Cool. And he came in and he said he was talking to McGovern 10 minutes later. And so to me, it's just, you know, that's one of those things that you would never find out from, you know, besides talking to him. And so we had three or four conversations about just what that was like. Huh. I mean, like you said, there was that. There's so many different pieces of articles and all these things that you got. I mean, what was your guiding force or your main theme throughout that you told yourself to write this book to keep it in the same line? Um, well, I think if we go back to what I said at the beginning, it was literally, I just threw stuff at the, you know, eventually I gave them the wall with the stuff all over it. And the publisher said, you know, congratulations, you have a wall with stuff all over. So then I had to kind of go through and pick out stuff. So I would not advise this as like a good organizing principle for anyone trying, because it's a terrible organizing for anyone writing a book. I think it was more that I picked out the stuff that was relevant from just all the stuff I found, you know, and I had like piles of extra stuff that was totally irrelevant. But at some point I had thought like, oh, that's really interesting. I'm going to find out about that. You know, so so that was like my problem, I think, was, you know, lack of focus in the research. And then I had to decide what was, and there's a famous thing about Michelangelo where he said, you know, to make David, he kind of cut off all the stuff that wasn't in the statue. And what was left was in the statue. Not that I'm claiming on Michelangelo, just that, you know, I had to get rid of all the stuff that was irrelevant. And some of it I was able to kind of spin off into articles because it was fun. But... You know, but it really was more I had to kind of figure out what the heck is my point. And when I was really happy when I kind of got it, got it down to how the NFL made itself political and then how politicians use the NFL in that time period. When you were writing it and choosing what, like you said, the Michelangelo, the, the stuff to cut out, were you, were you able to separate maybe your own biases on what you believed previously going into it? And it was purely like, I don't know, editorial or how did that work for you? Um, oh, it's hard. I mean, I think realizing things you'd assume to be true, I think is really difficult because you just think it's the way it is, right? I mean, and so for me, I think what was really useful was sort of realizing, you know, number one, so one of the kind of classic things I think people thought of in the 60s was that football is right wing, you know, that, you know, from the perspective of most freaks, you read these, you know, the and it's occasionally there's people writing for the alternative press who would say, you know, I really dig football, you know, that they liked football. But for most of them, it was pretty much, you know, football is played by fascists and Nazis. And if you like football, you're a fascist and a Nazi. And I think I really had that, you know, like football is right wing mindset. You know, there's, I mentioned, there's a famous George Carlin routine, which I remember seeing when I was, I don't know, 12, when he compares the rhetoric of football and baseball, you know, and, and, foot, and baseball is about going, and he says it in this way, you know, in baseball, I'm going home, I'm home. You know, football is about penetrating the end zone and it's, you know, all the war metaphors. And so I think kind of realizing that football, that people on the left use football, too, and people on the left like football, too, and that George McGovern loved football. And that, you know, when people said to McGovern, you know, things like, well, some people say football is fascist. McGovern, you know, who's probably the most left wing candidate ever to run for president, you know, said that's stupid. 
you know, the Hubert Humphrey, who was a big lefty, literally went on tour with three members of the Vikings Purple People Eaters, you know, their defensive line. He went on tour with those guys to kind of talk about, you know, he liked football. He wanted to play football. He went to the University of Minnesota, which was amazing at football in the early 30s. They won, depending on which you're looking at, three national championships. And I know a lot of those early ones, everyone claims they won the national championship. But, you know, Minnesota was great back then, you know, and a lot of these people, you know, who knew Humphrey said, you know, I think he really wanted to play football, but he was just way too small. But he was this huge fan of football. And I found this. So I got the stuff from the Humphrey papers, which is literally, I mean, I remember this. It's a stack of Xeroxes four inches high. And I'm thinking, all right, I got to read through every single one of these because it's, you know, the sort of athletes for Humphrey committee. And so, you know, so my larger story here is, you know, is, wow, people on the left really like football, too. And what's amazing is, and I found kind of creepy, is so Bobby Kennedy is assassinated something like one o'clock in the morning on June 5th, 1968. He's just won the California primary, you know, fairly clearly going to be the Democratic nominee for president in 1968. Then he's assassinated. Um, one of the people near him is Bubba, is Rosie Greer. Sorry, not Bubba Smith. There's Rosie Greer. You know, the defensive lineman who had kind of gotten politicized, he actually helped disarm Sirhan Sirhan, who shot Bobby Kennedy. Two day, I found this literally in the, in the Humphrey papers. Two days later, the Humphrey people are saying, you know, I guess there is one day of mourning. June 7th, they're sending out memos saying, let's recruit all the athletes who are in favor of Bobby Kennedy, get them to come work for us. You know, two days later, I just found that kind of mind boggling, just the political calculation of it, that they're already thinking, you know, how do we get Jackie Robinson? How do we get Rafer Johnson? How do we get all these well-known athletes who were following the Kennedy standard? Because Kennedy's dead. And so Humphrey's running for president and he's eventually going to get the nomination. So we need to get these guys on our side. And so for me, that was, that was one of those things that I just hadn't kind of anticipated was that people on the left would be just as eager to hang out with football players, to talk with football players, to use football players in their ads. There's literally, so there's a famous, book by uh, Harry Edwards from 1969 called The Revolt of the Black Athlete. And one of the photographs in there is of Hubert Humphrey with football players. You know, it was so successful, that kind of association Humphrey was able to draw, that it's in that book as a signal of the kind of political influence of the politically awakened football player. You know, and, and it was actually, it was a little frustrating. I probably should have tried this. Is you know, Alan Page, who was this Hall of Fame player who's on the defensive line for the Vikings and then campaigned with Humphrey later became a judge in Minnesota. So he had a whole political career of his own. And in retrospect, I really should have tried to see if Alan Page would talk to me. And just to find out, you know, what did, how were you thinking about things? What was it like? You know, so I certainly have things like that, that people who I wouldn't think of as conservatives were also just as interested in using football to kind of make a political point. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, I'll call that maybe your left-right realization. How about what was, if you could pick one thing that going into it and then coming out of this, you changed your mind totally after writing the book? Mm, okay, let me, that's a really good question. Let me think for a second. Um, I mean, I think maybe it is the thing about Nixon is just feeling like, well, I, so I guess like one of the things I started with in the first so I literally spent probably six years just rewriting two chapters, one of which was on radical athletes and sort of athletes protest, one of which was on journalistic coverage of football, which was literally the same sort of like football equals war point. Because I think there's, you know, that's kind of the first thing you find is that all these people in the 60s would say stuff like, you know, football is symbolic war because so much of the rhetoric sounds like that. You know, a lot of people who've written this have pointed out it's a really stupid analogy. You know, football, you have four downs. You don't get to, like, keep the football because you've, like, killed the other team. You know, there are rules in football that there are not in war. So football in some ways kind of has aspects of small unit combat in war, except with a bunch of rules that make it not at all like small unit combat in war. So I think that was the kind of operative metaphor in the 60s is that there are so many. You know, what's neat is when you kind of get to the point when you feel like you know what someone's going to say – and you do, because it turns out you've read enough of, you kind of gotten a sense of the time from just reading a lot. I mean, partly I would just kind of read newspapers. I just, I love reading old newspapers because you're just immersed in another time and just kind of understanding, you know, how people felt and kind of what their daily experience was. And so I think when I was able to kind of get beyond the people said football was like war point to see that in fact, people said football was like a lot of things. And sometimes people on the left would say things that, 
saw football as being a very positive experience or as being or as expressing some good aspect of America. So I think that was probably the biggest change for me was understanding that it just could be it could speak, it could mean a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people, and it didn't have a kind of one fixed political meaning. And you know, and I think one thing I, I realized is that the NFL wasn't I don't think it's super intentional. I have people who write on this who would probably disagree with me, who would say what the NFL did was clearly trying to sympathize with conservatives. You know, I think the NFL, if you look at things like Super Bowl halftime shows, you know, they have military flyovers. In 1970, they have the new Christy Minstrels, who are one of these singing groups, who are advertised as young people who protest with guitars. You know, so it's differentiating them from like weird long-haired people who clearly don't like football. You know, so I think the NFL kind of wanted to associate itself with Americanism. I don't think they were particularly conservative. And in fact, one of the things that was neat is if you read some of the NFL's books, the NFL's books actually say things like maybe America's really violent and that's why football's popular. You know, maybe there's something a little bit disturbing about the fact that football's popular, which I had not expected at all that the NFL would say, you know, and this is official branded NFL properties that are saying things like this. You know, and so that's that's I guess that's sort of a larger surprise is that not even the NFL was saying just, you know, football is extremely all American and patriotic. And if you don't like it, get out of the country. And that that really surprised me. Yeah, that's I mean, that's something that, like you said, you don't really realize until you dig into it. And you mentioned reading a lot of newspaper articles and you love doing that. What was the difference or maybe the biggest difference in whether it's the writing style or the writing voice from papers back in the sixties to some of the more modern stuff that you saw. Oh, um, I mean, it's interesting. There, there's a kind of, there's a common theme in people who cover 60s sports writing that they call it the chipmunks. But there's this famous joke about someone, you know, who's covering the Yankees who asked this kind of really obnoxious question. And so you have the kind of famous 60s sports writing that supposedly is very cheeky and kind of making fun of sports and maybe the most famous guy is Leonard Schechter, who co-wrote Ball Four with Jim Bouton, you know, who kind of stood in for that kind of irreverent, you know, football is stupid. Sports are stupid. I have to cover sports, but I'm going to make fun of it the whole time. So I was not <laughs> expecting to see that. And I kind of didn't. You know, a lot of what I read was, I mean, I read, so I had this thing called the Newspaper Index, which, and there's a bunch of these different things that all have titles like, you know, Index of Newspapers, Newspaper Index, newspapers.com. And you can find a bunch of small town papers. And that was, to me, the most interesting part was just realizing that people were really serious, that there's this kind of very earnest coverage in these small town papers of football. And so, you know, I looked a lot at Dave Megacy, who was this famous radical who was a Cardinals linebacker who first started protesting the national anthem. Then he chartered some buses for Students for Democratic Society. And, you know, then started basically in 69, he and a teammate had gotten radicalized and they started pushing for there not being grapes on the training tables because they'd been picked by non-union labor in California. And eventually he quit football. He grew his hair out. And he wrote this book called Out of Their League, which, you know, is always on the list of like the top 50 most important sports books. And it's basically about how football is stupid and fascist. And, you know, it's a product of this America. He literally says, you know, we have the most – that the most fascistic regime in American history is run by a football freak, Richard Nixon. And, you know, and I was reading all these responses to Megacy in these small-town papers, and they were so angry. I mean, literally one Dallas paper – I think – I know it's even a smaller town. It's a small town in Texas. I want to say Arvin, Texas, but it might not be. It was, just, it was a very small town. Literally said something like, well, you know, you do this. Next thing you know, you're shooting the president. It, it was like a straight line for them from, you know, saying football is bad and not going to play it anymore and growing your hair to assassinating John F. Kennedy. And, you know, so to me, it was just it was so interesting, the degree to which, you know, I think the kind of irony. I mean, I read, you know, I read The Athletic. Sometimes I read The Ringer. I read Peter King, you know, and I, and I read The Chronicle. I read The New York Times, you know, and so and you read now and I don't think most people who write for those sites would would write something unironically like that, you know, would say that, you know, Colin Kaepernick, at least on those sites, and there certainly were people who said, you know, Colin Kaepernick is everything that's wrong with America. You know, I, I and I don't know, I wouldn't, I didn't study it enough to know if you had sort of small town sports papers saying that kind of thing. You know, I know there have been people, people like Clay Travis, who have kind of made a career out of this, you know, Colin Kaepernick is what's wrong with America. He should just shut up and leave. <laughs> 
you know, but it seems like there was much more of that kind of opinion in the 1960s and 70s that there's a real difference between reading Robert Lipside in the New York Times and actually ended up, you know, having, I, I, sh- I talked to him a little bit. I should have actually talked to him more because he's, you know, he's one of the most famous kind of big newspaper lefty sports columnists. You know, and so there's a real difference between Robert Lipside in the Times and reading a small town columnist in the Oakland newspaper or these Midwestern newspapers or these Mid-Southern papers and just seeing, you know, that the kind of ironic vocabulary that I think most people have nowadays, you know, think of Deadspin, right, that the voice kind of Deadspin had where, you know, sports are kind of stupid, but we kind of love them and we're kind of embarrassed that we love sports, but we still think they're kind of stupid, but we still love them. You know, that kind of multi-layered ironic perspective didn't seem very, it didn't seem something that was around in 1970. Yeah. I mean, again, I haven't really read a whole lot of newspapers from back then. Yeah. Who has? um, (laughs) Yeah. Well, you have, you're you're maybe one of our subject matter experts and you've gone throughout all the various decades. And I mean, the book that ties a lot of different things from a political perspective. I mean, how does that kind of, let's bring us forward into 2020 and how does some of that stuff get resurfaced and how can you kind of correlate that to what's going on now? Um, yeah, I, I ended up doing a couple articles making that connection because one thing I think, I mean, the sense I got in 2017, 2018 was that the NFL didn't want to be in the position it was in. You know, it didn't it didn't want Donald Trump tweeting about Colin Kaepernick. It didn't want people tweeting in support of Colin Kaepernick. It didn't want Colin Kaepernick kneeling. And I know Roger Goodell literally, you know, apologized. And they didn't, you know, they didn't particularly do anything to see, you know, to try to reinstate Kaepernick or say – we're going to push for Kaepernick to play, which I, I didn't mean, I don't know if, if he still really wants to play. I know he had that tryout where he looked good, but you know, people write a tryout, you know, you throw a bomb to somebody and it looks good. You throw the ball 70 yards, the guy catches it. It looks great. There's nobody on defense. You know, I don't, you know, I'm not qualified to evaluate whether scouts watched him and thought like, yeah, we should definitely try to get Kaepernick to be our second string quarterback. But it seemed like the consequence of the book you know, that I showed was that the NFL had put itself in a position that was okay in the 1970s. And I felt it was really unhappy about in 2017, that it just kind of wanted the whole thing to go away because it was not in the midst of a kind of cultural maelstrom in the way that Colin Kaepernick and Trump's reaction to Kaepernick and then Kaepernick's reaction to Trump and all the other players' reaction. You know, I think partly also what's interesting is just, you know, the racial mix had changed that the number of African-American players was so much smaller in the late 60s and 70s. There was no union. So the kind of political consciousness that the players had, you know, you had Jim Brown, who's really famous, and Jim Brown, you know, quits the NFL at the height of his fame to become an activist. But you didn't have a lot of players who kind of had grow up, you know, having been inspired by people like Jim Brown and having been inspired by some of their college classes and having been inspired by years of African-American activism. You know, they didn't really have a voice in the 70s. And I think, you know, the football players, I remember, I think it was Bob McNair of the Texans, right? He talked about being the owner. And all the players were like, you know, owners got some resonances you maybe want to think about when you use them with a bunch of black athletes. You know, so I think it was, the NFL had kind of created this political, it crafted a political persona in a time when it didn't have to think about things like, what if we have athletes who have a really different perspective on things? You know, that they look at this, with a league that has, I think, one owner of color, I think just the Jaguars owner, Shaheed Khan. I'm not positive. Maybe there's two. You know, that they see themselves as not having a kind of economic voice in the league. They see themselves, uh, you know, they have a kind of labor power that they didn't have because there's no union for the players in 1970. So I think what was really different is that the NFL, I would imagine, looks back on the period of my book with nostalgia because they didn't have to worry about empowered players with the kind of political consciousness players have now, you know, understanding the ways in which they can leverage their voices on social media that, you know, so famously Dave Megacy, just because I did an article about this comparing Dave Megacy and Colin Kaepernick is that Megacy started protesting the national anthem and I couldn't find any coverage of it anywhere. I mean, I read the St. Louis papers. I read the national papers. I read everything. I, could, I read all the radical papers, right? You'd think, you know, if anything, the radical papers would have said, wow, Dave Megacy is not, standing for the, not observing the national anthem. He basically stepped out of line. He got in trouble for it. He writes about it in the book. Nobody covered it. And then after he wrote the book, Pete Rozelle basically issued a gag order for about four months. So the NFL just didn't respond. 
And I think that kind of, you know, they could, and eventually starting, so the book comes out, uh, I think, November 1970. And then eventually it became clear that it was such a big deal that they had to respond. And so they kind of would drum up players. They drummed up Jack Kemp. They drummed up coaches who would kind of line up to say, Dave Megacy is a terrible person. Dave Megacy hates America. Dave Megacy couldn't hack it. You know, just all the Dave Megacy is a loser. Spiro Agnew insulted Dave Megacy by name twice as a symbol of everything that was wrong with America. You know, and they they just couldn't do that in 2017 because of social media, because I think the players had a collective consciousness in a way. They had players like Eric Reed who would say, look what's happening to Colin Kaepernick. You know, you had Malcolm Jenkins, all these players who said openly, you know, we're standing for a collective identity here. And you can't just pick us off one by one. You can't isolate one player. You know, and, and Megacy really felt that, I think. You know, you read what he wrote at the time. This actually, this is just sad to me, is that he read, turned out he read one of the articles on the web and emailed me and said, you know, I'd love to meet because he was out here in the Bay Area. He's still got a house in Berkeley. And you know, I was going to meet him, which I thought would have been an amazing experience just for me to be able to tell him, you know, what a admirable, interesting figure he is. And then quarantine hit. You know, so we couldn't we couldn't do it. But it would have been so interesting just to kind of to see and compare this because it was the story, you know, people it was in the New Yorker, you know, somebody wrote that story about here's Dave Megacy, the first version of Colin Kaepernick. But I think to me the interesting part is that, you know, Colin Kaepernick was able to make an impact because he had access to media and other people who supported him had access to media in a way that Dave Megacy didn't. And I think that's you know, that's something the NFL was very unhappy about. <laughs> <laughs> well, regardless of anything, I mean, uh, as the everything uh, that I see, we evolve and hopefully this continues to evolve to make everything right as far as I'm concerned. And that one thing that I like to do on the episode, every guest, I, if you could see me now, I'm giving you the virtual keys to my DeLorean right here. And uh, <laughs> you go back in, back in time, any point in we'll call it any point in your book history and you can relive one moment and ask one person, one question, where are you going and what question and who are you asking it to? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's a great question. I've never thought about that. So let me, uh, wow. Yeah. If you're getting that baby up to eight, eight miles an hour and we're hitting that 1.21 <laughs> gigawatts right there for you. Um, oh, Wow. God, this, no, there's, oh wow, there's so many interesting questions about that. That That's one reason why it's such a tough question because there's so many. Yeah. Like, you pick one now and then two minutes after we hang up, you're going, oh, man, I wanted to say that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm 100% sure that's going to happen to me. Um, maybe, I mean, I guess maybe something with the, the merger because I think that's such an interesting story. What if the NFL and the AFL don't merge? You know, that, that – so unfortunately, Emmanuel Seller doesn't have any papers or there's nothing in his papers that I could find about this because he was furious that the NFL, like his committee was, he was single-handedly stalling the AFL NFL merger because he was saying, we're not going to hold hearings and it's not going to pass until I'm satisfied. And the NFL found another way to do it because there were literally like 15 bills in the Senate. You know, and, and it's amazing you read the testimony that all these senators are like, football is awesome. We want football. And I found an interview from, um, I think it was Bill Moyers, actually, who was Lyndon Johnson's legislative aide. And he said something like, it was unbelievable what senators would try to do to get football teams. You know, that's how badly they wanted NFL teams in their areas because they thought of them as such revenue generators. So feeling like what happens if, you know, Emmanuel Seller knows about this end run and is somehow able to rally public support and stop it. What happens? You know, if there's the AFL and the NFL, does the AFL die out? Does it carry on for a couple more years? Do both leagues sort of stagger into something? You know, I feel like to me, that's just a really interesting what if to think about how, because, you know, the big thing the NFL says in the hearings, the big thread is, you know, we have this thing called the Super Game next January. We think it's going to be a really big deal, which, you know, if you read the coverage, it's not. You know, the I think it was in um, the stadium, the USC stadium in Pasadena. I forget the name of it, Olympic Stadium, maybe something. I don't think that's it. But, you know, whatever USC stadium, and it was something like half full. You know, people were just not that into the Super Bowl the first year it was played. But the NFL holds it out as this big threat. Like, if you do not let us merge, we cannot have the Super Bowl, and God knows what's going to happen next. So I guess because I'm a historian, I'm kind of interested. Is like, what if the merger doesn't happen? What's, you know, where are we now? Right, yeah. Those whole what-if scenarios, that the, they always have the what-if NFL or what NFL, something like that. Yeah, and that's a – big one that we've even talked about on a show that I went on before called it's a, it's a podcast called histories 
what ifs and we <laughs> we did the whole we played like we played around just of course made stuff up and it was what if the AFL was actually the victors over the NFL and then things moved in and different teams and same scenario, just fun to kind of think about what if. And that's one reason why I started the show even because uh, time travel and history and things like that just super intrigued me. And of course the NFL is my passion as well. So I combined them together. And uh, speaking of passions, yeah. um, I know you have the website, but especially is there, Anywhere that you like the fans of the show to go to learn more about you or your book? Um, yeah, I think just it's it's just my name, jessebarrett.com. Seemed like the easiest thing. It's got, you know, it's got, you can order the book there. It's got articles I did if you're interested. It's got a way to email me. So I think that's, yeah, that's that's my entire promotional apparatus. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. And I'll, well, I always end up adding your links to in my show notes and I'll add an Amazon copy of the book to you, to the show notes as well. Like that way they can purchase it. Of course, affiliate account and all that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, with that, I mean, do you have any last parting words of wisdom to give the, (laughs) to the fans of the show? Um, just for me, what's always interesting is, you know, the famous line people said is like stick to sports. And I guess for me, that always just seems really weird is that sports are a part of the world. They're played by players who come from places who have experiences and beliefs. I think one of the things I really learned is that they're owned by people who have experiences and beliefs and ideas. And they're broadcast by people who have experiences, beliefs and ideas that are connected to a larger political world. And so for me, I feel like stick to sports is just avoiding the reality that sports are always part of the world. And I think it's a much richer way of I don't think it ruins being a fan. I think it makes you a much more informed fan if you kind of think about, you know, why your team is where it is and why it's named what it is and who paid for its stadium and who the players are and where they came from and who owns the team. I think to me, those make you a better fan. And so I guess that's the argument I'd make for knowing about things like history and politics as being part of being a good fan rather than something that detracts from the experience. Well, there you go. Take a little bit of time to learn about your team's history and even many of the different kinds of politics that might be involved. And what better way to learn about your favorite team or sports history than the Sports History Network, which is the headquarter for your favorite sports yesteryear. In fact, that's where you got to go right now. So you don't miss out on your opportunity for the enter into the contest for Jesse's book, Pigskin Nation. To do so, head over to sportshistorynetwork.com forward slash contest. Now, this is going to run through Sunday night of November 8th, so if you listen into the future, yeah, head over there anyways, because we always got book giveaways and other types of giveaways going on. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.